Joshua Smith here, and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. Now get shit done and smash that subscribe button now. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode Podcast, where every single week I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, and straight up top badasses. They're out there dominating their spaces. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, we have a massive honor to be here with very special guests actually at his property here in Indiana. So really stoked and honored to have Mr. Ed Ewing on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Well, thank you, Josh, and welcome to Santa Claus, Indiana. You know, you gotta behave while you're here because <laughs> Santa lives here. Yeah, now this is beautiful. I was telling Kara as we were pulling up, I'm like, this is truly heaven on earth. I mean, you have, what do you have? I mean, how many acres is this property? Well, it's about a thousand acres here, and it was, I acquired it over, uh, uh, about 30 years, uh, 14 acquisitions. And this was, uh, all of this property was basically cornfields, soybean fields. So all of the landscaping and the grades, I created them. Yeah, and you're originally from just right up the street, right? I'm well, not quite. I'm from Jasper, Indiana, you know. they Jasper, people wouldn't want to say they're from uh, Santa Claus, Indiana. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what Kara, we, we actually went to Jasper yesterday, had lunch in Jasper, and she was showing us around the town, and, you know, it's my first visit here to southern Indiana, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, Jay Cutler from right down the street, you know. Is he? Yeah, Jay Cutler went to school uh, right down the street here, about two miles. Okay, awesome, man. And Abraham Lincoln from here. Yeah, too. yeah, I spoke at the Lincoln Amphitheater yesterday, and that was such oh, an amazing he venue, yep. He was a little more famous than me and Jay Cutler. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep. So before we get into all the amazing things that you're up to today, because I mean, you've created such a uh, you know, tremendous amounts of success through your entrepreneur ventures and your, your success journey. But I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that led them there in the first place. So if we rewind the clocks, how did you get into entrepreneurship in the first place? Well, I get that question a lot. And um, the truth is, is I think that um, uh, all of us, you know, there's seven and a half billion people in the world and the seven and a half billion people in the world uh, all compete in one thing. They all compete in capitalism. Capitalism is you, you get up every day of your life and you go to work and sell a good or services and you try to, to create a better life for your family and yourself, to, better for tomorrow than today. And so, you know, there's only, Josh, there's only two and a half thousand billionaires in the world. 5,000 uh, uh, people that made more than $500 million. And my point is, is you have a 99.7 Sigma chance of, of being that financially successful. So why is that? I, I, I credit that, you know, when God sends us down the assembly line, you know, he, and I used to build trucks and cars. And so, you know, we all get parts. And I believe that, uh, that those 5,000 people simply got a God-given skill set, you know, that, that, that allows them to use those, those uh, computer chips to, to be more successful in business than others. And so I, I think that, uh, that you know, uh, the ones that are really good at that, you know, uh, are, were, were God-given skill. So you, so you, do you, so then by that, you believe it sounds like that there is an element of something that you're born with. I, I think so. And, you know, you know, we can all go to school, you know, for music and never sing like Whitney Houston, you know, and Elvis Presley. And so people can go to school for certain skills. You know, how many people, uh, seven and a half billion people in the world, a lot of them went to Princeton, Harvard and Stanford, you know, and Wharton. And a lot of those people work for me, yep. you know, and I'm a high school graduate. So, so um, I, um, uh, I think then is, is, is there's a certain point in time, too, where you realize that, you know, because you really don't know. I doubt when Michael Jackson was born that he knew he was a good singer. So, uh, you know, it, I, you'd be less than honest that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, I grew up, we didn't have a car, or coal stoves, you know, charge our groceries. We were very poor. Is there's a point in time to, to, to uh, you know, before you realize that. But I, but. But, but I think that, that at a young age, at a, at a very young age, is, is you start thinking differently. And there's a story they tell in my hometown that uh, Walt Disney was built in Disney World. And uh, 
we were, I was walking from the Little League Park and whatever year that was with two of my friends uh, from Jasper. And they were talking about, man, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to save my money and I'm going to go to, to Disneyland and I'm going to ride that roller coaster and ride all those rides. And I got my bat on my shoulder and my glove and, and uh, I'm listening. And they said, Eddie, I, I was Eddie back then, uh, uh, something wrong with you today? I said, no, why? And they said, you're not interested in going to Disney World? I said, oh, no, I'm not interested in going to Disney World. I want to own it. Yeah. And so in my mind, I wasn't, wasn't thinking about the roller coaster. I was thinking about the old movie theaters, you know, where they got the little booth, you collect the money. And I saw a long line of people and I envisioned myself in that, in that booth and this long line of people taking in the money. And when I was real little, I didn't read comic books, but I was in love with Scrooge McDuck. You know, he had that big house and he'd get on the diving board, you know, and he'd dive into that <laughs> in that money. And so why? Why is it, Josh? Is why is it at 10 or 11 or 12 years old? Uh, you know, you, you don't want to ride on a roller coaster. You know, now you're 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 not from a wealthy family. You're poor. But what is it in your DNA that causes you, you know, to to not want to go to Disney World, that you want to own it. And, um, you know, your net worth is not your self-worth. And um, uh, I knew, I never worried about being poor at 10, 11, 12 years old because I knew it wasn't going to be. And uh, one of my teachers said, you know, I was doing some calculation one day. They said to me, I was like 11, said, you're doing discounted cash flows. I said, I don't know what that is, but I know having a dollar today, you know, is better than having a dollar tomorrow. And one of the things interesting, too, is that, that you know, when you don't have a phone and you don't have any money, is, is you may be advantaged because you can't call your mom and dad for money. You can't call anybody because you don't have a phone. And so I think about this all the time, and, and I've met people throughout uh, my career that, you know, at 12 years old is, uh, uh, I got up at 3.30, even four in the morning and got on my bicycle, went up to a drugstore, picked up 110 newspapers in the rain and the snow, you know, and delivered those doggone newspapers. And, uh, you know, went home, got ready to go to school. My mom and daddy didn't wake me up. You know, uh, I, we had one of those alarm clocks with the bells on top of them. You know, I can't stand that to this day, but, uh, but, uh, when you don't have any financial resources, you may be advantaged because your only choice is to go earn it. You know, whether mow yards or, you know, I was never out of money because, you know, uh, I knew my, in order to have my books for school and clothes for school is I had to go earn it. And I think today, you know, uh, how many 12 or 13 year old kids would get up at 13, you know, at 3.30 in the morning you know, get on their bike in the snow and the rain yeah. and go put those newspapers in that, in that bag, uh, you know, and go deliver them and then put your clothes on and go to school. So, so I, I think, you know, that, that it starts at an early age. At an early age is, is determination and enthusiasm are, are, are really, really important uh, to being financially successful. And, I, you know, I have one of those things that there's people that, you know, you know, want to win. But the people that want to win will, will never be as, as successful as the ones that refuse to lose. Yeah, I love that. And then, you know, one of, and there's a saying out there that the worst enemy to greatness is good enough. You know, and you can have that drive and you see, you see so many people that are on this journey to go out there and create success, but they get, they get to a point in life where it's like, hey, I've created a, a good amount of success. I've created, I have a good lifestyle. Now, you know, why don't I take the foot off the accelerator? And, you know, I mean, you, but for you to create the amount of wealth and success that you've created and continue to create, you know, you didn't stop. You know, what over all these years is, continues to keep you that driven? Uh, that's a really good question. And, uh, uh, I think when, 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 to me, is, is wanting to be really, really good at everything you do is a major component of being successful. But to me, is I, you know, I played basketball, I played baseball, you know, I played a lot of sports. And, uh, and many times in my career, I thought, you know, to quit. 
But, but to me is, is I view capitalism as seven, my competition, you know, you play in the NFL, you play professional baseball, you know, uh, you play golf, is how many people are in those leagues? You know, a few hundred. Ah, but Josh, in the game of capitalism, there's 7.5 billion people with all levels of education. And so, is I view it as like five quarters, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 55, 55 to 65, and now 65 to 75. And so, what you do is getting up every day, and, and in basketball, you know, the metric in basketball for greatness is points, assists, rebounds, and NBA ranks. In capitalism, the score for capitalism when you quit at 65 or 75, whenever, is your personal net worth. How you, if you started from zero, remember again, 500, 5,000 people in the world yeah. make more than 500 million. But think about this, in the NBA, you know, playing basketball is, you know, uh, is a tough game. But in capitalism, you compete with seven and a half billion of the quickest, fastest, smartest, most intelligent people on the planet. Your competition is the world. And when you're 75 years old, how well did you do? Through your performance and enthusiasm and dedication and never quit, you, your measurement will be if you made more than $500 million, Ah, uh, you were a little bit better than an NFL ring. You beat out the fastest, quickest, smartest, and various levels of education. You competed in the a really difficult intellectual game. And your skill there on how your net worth, how much of your net worth you accumulated, is that's your metric on how well you did personally in competing in the game of capitalism. Yeah, so it's really not, I mean, the, the it's, you know, a lot of people I think will see people with a lot of money and think that they're just greedy or whatever it may be, but it sounds like it's not so much about the money, and I'm sure having the money is nice, but it's about really to the core seeing where you can take your potential. Well, well, it, it, to me, is, is my guess is, my, my guess is, you know, when you go to school, I remember in school, they, they, the teacher said, Ed, you're not normal. My goodness. And they teach that, you know, abnormal is a bad word. My guess is, Josh, that the 5,000 people that have more than $500 million, not a, not a one of those people are normal. Yep. And so, so, you know, abnormal is a good thing. And so there's nothing wrong with being, you know, in the middle of the bell-shaped curve. But what happens is, 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 is that I think that that your determination in order to 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 and in, 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 to be able to compete, you know, in, in capitalism and, and and never never quit, you know, and and I have a saying: complacency is the enemy of progress. Is is if you want to be good at something, what happen, what happens is is you need to outperform, you know, every, everyone else, and so once you become complacent. Is, is someone will come along and, and, and kick your butt. And so when you decide that, you know, this level of performance is good and I want to quit, I think you ought to step down. And one of the examples I was used is Rocky Balboa. You remember in the movie Rocky, you know, had nothing and Rocky became, you know, champion of the world. You remember the Rocky II where where he was watching the TV and he says, Mr. T, you know, yep. was, was knocking the bags off the wall. And he said, he said, Rocky, uh, he said, uh, uh, look at this. I, Rocky Balboa, I champion of the world. He said, no, 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 look at this. He said, uh, this guy has the eye of the tiger. And Rocky said, well, what, 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 what do you mean? He said, when a tiger is in the hunt in the jungle, he has, looking for his food, he has this look about him. And that's the look that you had when you wanted to be champion of the world. You no longer have the eye of the tiger. And so I, I, I think that, that when, when you become complacent, is someone else 
like me that has the eye of the tiger is coming for you. I have a, I have a, uh, uh, I, I teach sometimes at Columbia University and uh, is uh, the master's program and they're from all over the world. And so when I was a little boy, as you know, we'd get the Sears catalog and uh, everybody else would look at, uh, you know, the toys. And I would get the, get the catalog out and I would go to the craftsman tool section. And I thought, man, I'm, someday I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to earn enough money to get, remember, Josh, that, that tall craftsman tool set with the 50 drawers and all the tools. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy me that tool chest and I'm going to go out in the world and I'm gonna have every tool this. And so what I tell the class is I said, you know, when you, you, you graduate from Columbia, you guys, I'm envy of you because you're gonna go out in the world and you're gonna have all those tools in that set. And you're going to go to compete. And then I would walk Josh to the middle of the classroom and I pulled out, you remember the little bitty Craftsman screwdriver? Yeah. And I would say, this one <laughs> right here, by the way, thank you. I would pull this out of my pocket in the middle of the class with the professor in the back of the room. And I said, my name is B. Edward Ewing. And all I have in my tool chest is this little screwdriver. And I'm going to kick your ass. What is my point? My point is that you can have all of these tools. But you have to compete to the people that just have the eye of the tiger determine enthusiasm, never quit. And they know that the only way they could be successful is through performance. And here's what is important about creating that worth. You should go, and when you leave those schools, my experiences have been when I have rooms full of those people work for me, is they teach them how great thou art. And what happens is that's never as good as your goal should be through your personal performance if you want to be financially successful because you got to work for somebody else and when you work for someone else you got to make them money if you make them money then they can give you some yeah. if all you work and you're working on the wrong things and you're not creating value for them they're not going to pay you anymore so the fact of the matter is is that 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 uh is through your performance is to get everybody else to say you're great, as opposed to you saying you're great. A major portion of creating net worth and, 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 and being financially successful is the money will follow if you focus on your performance, as opposed to I'm just how great thou art and you should just pay me. And so, so I believe that, I, that people like me uh, can all do exactly what I did. I'm not anything special. Is I'm simply a person that understood that I didn't have the skill uh, of the people with all the, the tools, that I only had the screwdriver, and that the only way I have to be successful is just outwork everybody. And so my advantage was I knew my weakness and my weakness was I didn't have those skills. So how can I overcome my competition is through just hard work. Yep, no, I love that. And then when it comes to hard work, because you know there are people that we've seen and that you know I personally know and I've seen that, I mean, work extremely hard, but they still struggled to go out there and create the wealth that they want to create. So how important is it when working it- Working the wrong thing. Yeah, well, that's what I was gonna ask. How important is it to work hard with the right vehicle kind of combination, working on the right things? I, I, I have like, like three components of that. One, one is you're, you're born and, 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 and one, you go to school and you take a lot of subjects that have no value whatsoever on, on, on creating net worth for yourself. So you should focus every day on, do you have a micro level plan? I'm 25 years old, here's my net worth, and 35 years old, you know, here's what I wanna be, and then how? 
And, and so the, the, the magic is in micro level every day that you're working on things that improve your net worth as opposed to someone else. And I have a saying on that is that we get distracted. You know, we get distracted along the way. And, and one of the things I find is I would make every day, every week, every month, here's the five things I want to do. Now, what happens is, is my guess, Josh, is that, that, you know, every day you say, I want to do these things. And so at the end of the day, you know, did you have a list of the things you wanted to do to cause yourself to be, you know, more financially successful tomorrow than today? And so what happens is you leave home. And then, then one of the examples I use is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, my ex-wife. I used to get so frustrated with her in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, that uh, we get in the car and, you know, you go Saturday morning to the shopping center and, you know, there's no cars there and we got to want to get something. So she goes up and down the stalls and up and down the stalls, you know, and you ever see your dog go outside to go to the bathroom? You know, they, you know, it's raining and you're waiting dog, and they can't, you know, like, Go to the bathroom, you know, like pick a parking stall. Please pick a parking stall. You know, go in and get the damn item and let's get back. And what happens is, is then you go home and you're mad and you said something and you're mad. You know what was wrong? You elected to be in the passenger seat. The reason that people you're born today and, and you know, at age 75 is on a daily basis when you leave home, were you the driver? Or were you a passenger? You never will get to where you want to be if you get in the driver's seat. So it's a small example of, of you know, is, on a micro level, do you have a plan at 25 to get to what you want to be at 35? And what happens is, do you elect to be, do you work on things every day that makes Josh Inc., CEO of Josh Inc., work on the things that causes your net worth to be better? Or are you in the passenger seat and you're going where other people want you to go? And so the time clock, so you're 35, you know, and you got 5% done of what you want because Josh got in the passenger seat. Josh was not the driver. Yep, yep, love it, powerful stuff. Um, you know, I'm curious with, um, you know, all the success that you've created and now you have private planes, yachts, you know, beautiful homes and, and, you know, all throughout the country. Did you ever fathom earlier on that you would have this much success? It may sound funny, but yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. When I was like 9, 10, 11 years old, you know, we got evicted a couple times because we couldn't pay the rent. And, and I used to sit around and think, you know, and I found out about amortization schedule. Well, you know, you buy a house, you know, and they finance it 40 years. You know, and you finance it 40 years, you pay down a penny a year. And so, you know, you finance it 15 years, you know. I, I, I imagine, you know, 300 million people in America, and I owned every one of their houses. And those sum of guns was, you know, and then I was adding up in my head the mortgage, you know. And, and, and that was, and by the way, when you get somebody else to pay down a dollar your principal, you know, in a 39% tax bracket, you know, you made a dollar 39. So, so. My point is, you remember I talked about the DNA when God sends you down the line? What causes you at 10 years old to think like that? You know, is everybody else is riding their bicycle, you know, and, 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 and doing whatever they're doing. But I'm, I'm thinking at 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, is how in the hell am I going to get 300 million people, you know, and I own all their houses, you know, paying down principal every day. And so... So uh, again, but, but I tell you that, that uh, one of the advantages of being financially successful is, is uh, uh, one of, the, one of the, 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 the advantages of being financially successful is when I was 25 years old and, and I would talk, you know, you're a dummy. And, and if I had $100 million at 25 and I talked, I would be a genius. Yeah. And so I get a kick out of television today, you know, some of the dot-com people that they interview on television and their political views and whatever. And so your net worth is not your self-worth. When you have no money, you're not stupid. And when you have a lot of money, you're not intelligent. You know, and so you're viewed, you're viewed, uh, you know, like the, the honest truth is, let's just talk about this interview. Josh, if I had, uh, you know, uh, $10,000, you wouldn't be here today talking to me. And so I would have the same points of view. But the fact of the matter is, is, is creating net worth allows you a platform 
to speak and change opinions of things, whereas that's one of the advantages of, 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 of being financially successful. The disadvantages of being fi financially successful is people think you're different. You know, they, 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 they think you're different. You know, uh, uh, people say, I can't invite you, I come back home here, you know, and people don't invite you over the house because yeah. they don't think you'll come. You know, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and then you invite them over your house and they don't think they've, you know, you know, they need to dress up or do something, you know, when the fact is, is in my heart and in my head, uh, I am Eddie Ewing yep. with the paper route. And uh, don't confuse that with is uh, when it comes to making money is uh, uh, is I'm serious, the heartbeat, you know, uh, uh, because it's a game. Yeah. And and I made money not to make the money. I made money by knowing my weaknesses and knowing what I had to work on. Quick story on that. Along the way, I had a lot of people that I worked for, and I would 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 observe things. So I'm like 23 years old, and when I was 29 years old, I was vice president of North American Truck Group for International Harvester, you know, with thousands of people working for me. And, but I had some bosses, really, really, really smart bosses. Uh, you, by the way, along the way, it's people say, well, you know, I got a dumb boss. So if you think when you start here and you go here, all your boss is going to be telling you they're not. And so one of the challenges that's interesting is you got to get through them all. But I was on a golf course with three of my bosses, and, uh, and uh, they, they wanted to go play golf, and they played play golf for it. So they went to the golf course, you know, and they had, they had, they had uh, you know, pull cart, par three, right, 16 clubs, you know, and every bag. So we come up, and you know, I never played golf. What, what, hey, 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 Josh, tell me what you, well, you hit this. Well, these guys were older fellows, you know, and that didn't help because I, I, you know, I needed about, you know, uh, two clubs higher. And so as we get through eight or nine holes that, uh, that I looked at him and I said, uh, John, this guy's name was John Heron. I said, John, you know, you got, boy, the bank's right. You got 16 clubs. Why don't you hit that club? He said, I can't hit it. And I said, well, John, how many of those clubs? I said, why don't you just bring the five you use yeah. every day? <laughs> and here's my point. The be successful in business or your life. We all go out and we hit the five damn clubs we're good at. My goodness gracious, my lesson was, if I wanted to be really good at golf, I'd leave those five clubs at home. Knowing your weaknesses, knowing what you don't know and working and on everything every day on all the things that you can't hit. Yeah. We all know, Josh, we all know the clubs in our bag that we're not good at. But what do we do? That's a significant reason why only 5,000 people have more than 500 million is because we're all safe. And if you want to be better tomorrow than you are today, you need to get those other 12 clubs out of your bag because you know, you know, everyone knows what clubs they can't hit and what's their weakness. Yep. Yep. No, I love that. Yep. Got to get out of that comfort zone. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm curious with, you know, most of our audience are, are tied to the real estate business and, uh, you know, most are, are trying to create their wealth through investing in real estate and so forth. And I know a lot of your net worth and success has come from real estate investments. Um, you know, as far as with the timing that we're in, because we're seeing some unique things in the country taking place and, uh, um, you know, where... If you look at today, where are some of the places that you would recommend for somebody that has some money right now that's looking to grow their real estate investments? I mean, are there specific states, specific areas, specific things that you look at now today when you're getting into real estate investments? That's a very good question. I get that often, actually. In fact, now is one of the things if you make money is that, you know, the hardest part about making money is keeping it. Yeah. Right. 
So you end up with cash. And so, so uh, I, get, I get that question from, and calls from people all over. This is my view. Uh, my view is that Americans are going to grow from 330 million to about 500 million people. 50% population growth between now and 2040, 2050. Um, and by the way, the population of people over 65 will quadruple. So like it or not, like it or not, we're going to move more and more towards socialism. And, 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 and that's really, 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 really bad economically because in all, capitalism, seven and a half billion people in the world, whether you're communist or, 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 or regardless of a democracy, you know, or a military dictatorship, seven and a half people, it, when you're giving something away, seven and a half billion people on this earth are all capitalists. They sell, a, they get up every day and create a good or service. And in order for me to give you a dollar, if I'm communist or whatever, I have to sell it for a dollar more than it costs. Because I can't give, give a dollar away if I didn't have a gain. So all of us are capitalists, like or not. So capitalism will only function if you're for profit, if you're pro profit. If I were the president of the United States, when I would buy companies, I would have a cover sheet on everything that says cash up, debt down, reduce costs. And if you were trying to do something that didn't have cash up, debt down, reduce costs, I just didn't do it. If I were president of the United States today, I would say it, it, it causes, it, it enhances uh, profit, you know, it eliminates bureaucracy, and it will cause every American to have more of its discretionary money that it earned tomorrow than it has today. Those are three things because discretionary income is what people spend that grows the GDP, okay? So, so, so to me is we're gonna move more and more towards, towards socialism. There will be a flight to safety, a flight to safety of companies and a flight to safety uh, of, of, of money. So when you look at the population is going to grow by 50%, uh, 500 million people. Where are you going? You're going to go to states that are pro-business. Where are they? There, no estate taxes, no state income taxes, pro-business, pro-profit. To me, I think the best states in the United States, the top two, will be Texas and Tennessee. In Texas has about a thousand people a day moving to Texas, but in Texas you got Austin, San Antonio, Houston, you know, and Dallas. In Tennessee, which is you know the center of the United States, this side of the Mississippi, is only 1.7 million people, and and it has all the same demographics, but it has Nashville baby, you know. You got Knoxville on one side, Memphis on the other, but all roads leave to Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee is music, healthcare. Now they're moving in technology, you know, and in colleges. And so if the population is going to move from 330 million to 500 million people and companies and people are going to have to migrate to states that are pro-business, income producing property in Texas, Tennessee and Florida, in my view, is where I would go. By the way, that uh, the thank you for the question, but that uh, now what I'm working on is my kids trust. And so I'm moving to income producing properties in Texas and Tennessee, Dallas and, and Nashville for the for for the reason of which you just asked the question that I believe income producing properties. And so, you know, our, our government's going to move to 30 plus trillion dollars of, of deficit. And so right now, real estate in Florida and Tennessee and Texas is up 20, 25 percent. And only because is that interest rates are, you know, historical low. And so that, that the, the flight to safety with cash, because I believe that the stock market, you know, uh, 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 is in a windfall situation right now, driven by I have no idea. You know, uh, we're back to a company like Tesla, you know, has never made a nickel yet and the stock's $2,000 a share. Now, I'm for Elon Musk, but I remember the dot-com areas, you know, where people were buying companies for, for uh, you know, with, with no profit. But I think real estate, income-producing properties, and here's what I like about real estate. Income-producing properties, not levered. Finance 15 years so you get all the amortization schedule. 
and and I have fun at, at one of the business schools I won't talk about is the advantage of being a high school graduate. I said, I remember, uh, I, I remember, you know, when 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 I was, you know, taking this business course, they they use this term bankruptcy, and I said, bankruptcy, like, what's that? And they said, well, you know, when your 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 assets, you know, are less than your liabilities. I said, well, 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 what's an asset? An asset, you know, something you, you own, you know, real estate. I said, what's a liability? Liability is, you know, what you owe. And so bankruptcy, when your liabilities are greater than your assets? They said, yeah. I said, well, I'm not going to be bankrupt. I'm just not going to have any, none of them there. Yeah. And so to me is, is leverage debt is bad. If I... Uh, in fact, I've recommended this for a year, the, you know, that that uh, during the Greenspan days is that Americans for 15 or 20 years were spending 107 percent of their income. So savings going down, debt going up and the laws of economics are laughing at us. Yeah. You know, people spending more than they make and everybody uh, add more debt, you know, laws of economics, laws of economics. Josh, don't care if you're a person, a municipality a federal government or a corporation. They just don't care. When you violate the, and I, I call it that, that you know, in, in, in sixth grade, you know, in fifth grade, two times two is four, you know, and three times three is nine. And when they tell you three times three is 10, uh, you know, I call it the sixth grade test that it's not. And so, so to me is, is, is uh, our deficit that we're running is is not good everybody knows it and in a uh, flight to safety and and what's going to happen is if houdini is president or, or or jesus is that the only way you you get out of 30 or 40 trillion dollars of debt is inflate your way out because you know and so therefore a dollar that buys, you know, uh, 50 cents worth of something. And so that's coming in the next 10 to 20 years is that inflation's coming because the only way, you know, they're downstairs printing money, you know, they're printing money, you know, and putting it into the system. It's going to generate inflation. And so you want an asset that's income producing. So a thousand dollars of rent will be 2000 and you really want a 15 year fixed rate and mortgage at 3% because when, when the thousand dollars covers the three percent mortgage, when it's two thousand or three thousand, you're going to be really happy about yourself. Yeah. But the best thing about real estate is, is you know, um, a lot of people buy, build, build a house, flip it, sell it, make money, spend it. You create net worth for yourself in real estate by owning. As I have, I've, I have up in Jasper, Indiana, I have, on the corner of Clay Street. I have a $9,000 house and a lot that came with it and a $40,000 house next door that I assume the mortgage. Those are worth a half a million today, yes. okay? And, and, and uh, people paid them off a long time ago. My return on investment is infinite because I'd never put a nickel in them. And so guess what? If you, if you, you know, have a million dollars worth of houses today you know, uh, and, and those properties up there that, that you know, uh, didn't even cost $50,000 are now worth 10 times that in a town of 15,000 people. It's not New York. It's not Palm Beach. It's not, it's, you know, it's not Los Angeles. Yep. And small punk town USA, those $50,000 worth of properties are worth $500,000 20, 30 years later. Yeah. Now, if you own them, let people paid for them and you didn't sell them. My banker, I can go down to my bank and appraise for $500,000. He'll own me, he'll own me $400,000. $400,000. You know my taxes on that $400,000 are? Yeah. Zero. Yep. Because I refinanced. That $400,000 is now like $600,000 pre-tax, right? So I made $600,000 of net worth on zero investment on $50,000 for the property. So owning real estate in areas that, that have two things going for it, appreciation and inflation be your friend. Yep. It's coming. Yep, so stack up as much as you can right now. Yeah, if, if I were 25 years old, as uh, 35 years old, 
at 3% or less mortgage rates. If you have that much DNA in your system at 3% mortgage rates or less, you should be buying even at inflated prices all the property you can. Do not, do not, do not finance that property 30, 40 years. That's a big mistake. You finance a property 34 years, end of 10 years, you paid down 20 cents on the mortgage. And then the, 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 the repair, you have to put back in it, you gotta go borrow it, and so your base has never changed. You should only buy things that, that, that the cash flow from that has a high probability of being amortized 15 years or less. And then what happens is, is that, you know, as rent moves up, you pay for it in 11 and 12 years. Is uh, all the property that I have uh, that I anywhere, uh, my mortgage is zero. Yep. Thank you to my tenants. Yep. Yep. Love it. So then, uh, you know, with, with some of the big investors that I've met and talked with that are, you know, at your, or I don't want to say your level of success, but that are, you know, what we call mega investors like yourself, you know, sometimes they might be in a different camp. You know, for example, oh, only go with multi units, you know, right? And others might be more heavily towards single family tax or, what, or a mixture of those. In your opinion, um, does it make a difference? I mean, is, is there, it, whether it's for somebody that is wanting to jump into that and start growing their portfolio, is it, is it more important just to get started and just owning real estate? or to have a strategy as an example, going after multi-units versus single family attached and so forth? Well, most of the people you talked about on that are general partners with other investors. I don't have any investors. Yeah. I've never had any investors. And so, so on every investment that you make is you should think about your exit previous to the acquisition. How are you going to exit? Now what happens is in multifamily, Multifamily, when you go to exit, that exit will be driven by cash flow. You have, you have a, a, a cost, the, the other two opportunities for value of a property is the cost to replace, and the other one is market. So I do duplexes. I do duplexes in towns of 15 to 50,000. I'm the, I'm the best place to live in town of 15 to 50,000. It's like the guys with the golf clubs in the bag. How did I come up with that? General observation. When in towns of 15 to 50,000, in towns of 15 to 50,000 that, that have a, a diversified a, economy. And so how many of them? Many. And so, so what happens is in those towns, people leave, go to college, come back home, get married, and they have to live in a place until they save money for a house. And also in those towns, major opportunity is people over 55. Now, what it used to be is 55 was old. And so they started doing you know, nursing homes. Now what happens is actually the people over 55 hate nursing homes because they think nursing home, the next place is the cemetery, you know, and then they've got, they, 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 it's like, a, you know, a purgatory. Then between nursing home now, you know, and apartment, they have, you know, assisted living, right? So that's kind of the purgatory of, of real estate. So they really don't like that either. And so because of the health of Americans that are living longer, the demand for, I don't have to mow the yard, I don't have to do anything, but it won't happen. Would you, over 55, and you're gonna to live to be 85, do you wanna live in multifamily place, going up an elevator, you know, whatever? No. And so in small town USA, I do 100 to 100, and, 100 to 200 units. In a town of 15,000 to 50,000, are there 200 upper middle class people, and why them? Okay, and so I build ranches, 1,200 square foot, two bedrooms, 1,600 square foot, three bedrooms, 2,000 square foot, four bedrooms, two car garages, yards, you know, uh, one level or, or two story, put the masters on the first floor. And so I'm the Sam Walton, if you will, of upper middle class people and 15 to 50,000. Here's why. Your only competition there is some local yokel 
that makes a couple of units, you know, for retirement investment, right? So, and what's interesting is, is nobody, and I do duplex communities in towns that size. We run like 98% occupied. Now, here's what's good about a duplex. One is I'm never gonna sell, okay? And, and uh, my, my uh, original units I built 30 years ago, 35 years, for $24 a square foot. Now what happens, you build for $130 a square foot. The original units rented for $125 to $150. Now those same units are $850. You know, they paid for a long time ago. And so, you know, I could go down to the bank, you know, and borrow, you know, a huge amount of money. But I basically, what, my, my strategy that I would recommend to you is thinking through your exit. On my duplexes, I can turn it and kind of minimize it, sell off each half for residential prices other than cash flow, right? And so, so, so you know, or sell two of them to, you know, somebody wants to live in one side and rent the other. Now, I did that because, because I think the upper middle class people in small town USA, and then I go out by, by you know, I, I used to figure out how I'm going to pick the town. Well, then I found out that, man, Sam Walton and Wendy's and those guys probably have a team of people that could pick these towns better than me, especially Walmart. So I go about by Walmart and buy 20, 25 acres, you know, and, uh, and just pay for it and build, you know, 100, 120 units, and you're the best place to live. Let me tell you what's interesting about that. We don't spend $2,000 a year on marketing because in a small town USA, you go to Dallas or whatever, and you do a high rise multifamily, you know, and I mean, how many of those are there yeah. in small town USA? And here's what else I like about it. Well, if you're starting out and you want to make money, I like $20 million bills everywhere as opposed to 150 to $200 million bills. And, uh, yeah, I remember I drove down the road and the first time I saw that bumper sticker, ah shit, <laughs> is just when you think you're so damn smart that what I'm doing is foolproof, uh, you know, the road to hell is paved for, for that mentality, is having, and one thing good about small town USA, the economy goes up, not much happens. Yeah. Economy goes down, not much happens. So as a long-term owner and value creation for yourself, my recommendation is income producing properties, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not high rise multifamily, but general partnerships can't do that. See, right. that's why, I, that's my advantage. They're not coming. They're not coming to, to you know, small town USA. And so your and so if you want to create value for yourself, who cares, you know, being famous is a really dumb objective. Yeah. What you want to be is rich. If you're rich, you know, you can go in a restaurant, you know, and tip them and get a seat, right? And nobody bothers you. So one of my other things, too, is that, uh, that uh, uh, working on being famous is, uh, I never forget, is Henry Crown, uh, is Chicago, the Crown family. Uh, and then Lester and Renee now, and then the next generation. I flew with him, and I was maybe 30. And first time I flew in a private jet from Detroit to Chicago. And I said, Mr. Crown, I said, uh, what's your most significant accomplishment? He said, to be rich and not famous. Yeah. He said, I financed Howard Hughes. He said, young man, don't ever work on being famous. It's a dumb objective. And, but along the way, I've, I've had a lot of, lot of people that give one-liners like that Josh that are significant tr contributors to how you think. Yeah. And I, I thank them, you know, uh, uh, a little bit of wisdom, you know, common sense, you know, makes, makes, common, makes, it, makes Indiana sense. Yep, love it, powerful stuff. And I know we're going long on time. I know we've got a, uh, a speaking event or a, 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 an event that you're hosting right after this interview with a bunch of real estate agents besides sharing that, more knowledge with us. Besides that, it's really warm here. Uh, it is warm, it and is I warm. I my 24 hour deodorant just went on 25 <laughs> hours. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I've been wiping the, the sweat away out here, but uh, no, it's been amazing. And I just, I have one last question for you before we wrap up here. You know, knowing everything you know now today, you know, if Ed today could go back and have a conversation with a younger version of yourself, you know, whatever age you want to 
choose 18 years old 20 you know whatever point of of that younger version of yourself that you want to choose but if you could give again knowing everything you know now give yourself two pieces of advice that you'd want to give a, a younger self what would you tell your younger self focus personal discipline because when making money a lot of people never make it to the 500 million dollars because money brings Money brings as many problems as it solves. Yeah. Uh, focus, personal discipline, and never quit. Yeah. Never. Never give up. You know what? Quitting's easy. Yeah. You know why? Anybody can do it. Yeah. Anybody can quit. Yeah. No, I love that. Powerful stuff. And this has been such an honor. You know, thank you so much for having us out to your lovely property and giving us so much of your valuable time. This has been an amazing experience. While you're, while you're here in Santa Claus, Indiana, I want you to know that you need to behave because I've lived here so long that Santa now just brings me bills. Yeah, <laughs> we're doing it. I'm hoping to get on his good side. Okay. Thank <laughs> All right, well, thank you, thank sir. You, thank you. Uh -huh. And thank you guys so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time. Hope you enjoyed this GSD Mode podcast episode. Now make sure you get shit done and smash that subscribe button now.